This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Ed Malone has been serving as a pastor for 48 years, and then along with being a pastor, he enjoys raising black Angus cattle, carpentry, and writing. And he has a unique way of helping us understand principles in the Bible in a very simple way. Those cattle know your voice and they'll follow you anywhere. That dog knows your voice, she will follow you into a fire if she had to. Absolutely. We got to know Jesus yeah, I, that well. Yes. I, I, you know, I like to uh, uh, say to, you know, some of the folks who've read the book, he said, I know I'm going to meet Satan in heaven. <laughs> because she, she taught me so many life lessons. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm her shepherd. And I, 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 I always say, I want to be to my shepherd as Sada is to me as her shepherd. Mm -hmm. When I step outside and she sees that I, you know, if I've got on my Sunday go to meet and shoes, she doesn't even get up. When she looks <laughs> she knows. and I've got on my boots and she knows I got the farm clothes on, man, she jumps up, her eyes sparkle, her, you know, she's standing there waiting for me to say, come on, Sada, we got stuff to do. And, you know, I want to be that way with my father, but, you know, I, I can't be that way unless I know his voice. Unless I have fed with him, you know, my cattle know me because I'm the one that feeds them. I'm the one that opens up new fields for them in the summer to go to fresh grass. And so when I walk in the field, they're thinking, oh, man, he's here to help us. He's here to do something for, for us. Maybe he'll take us to a new field. Well, that kind of excitement with God as my shepherd, where when he steps into to my world and says, come on, Ed, we got some things to do. I want that relationship with him, and that's most that's on that's a total meaning of life to me. Yeah, it's when he says, "Come on, and we've got something to do." You don't care what that thing is that he has you to do, because he's already got your life. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, like, like, go yeah. Ahead. Another another word picture you paint that I really I had never thought of, but I I, I really liked was uh, you talking about really your job is to grow good grass, and there's Absolutely. only a couple ways you can do that, and. Uh, Paint that word picture for us, because it's a, it's, a, it's a good one. All right. People are saying to me, oh, I hear that you raise cattle. And I said, well, if there's no grass, uh, there's no cattle. So really, I raise grass. <laughs> but if I, you know, grass doesn't grow uh, uh, easily, but weeds do. Yeah. And I said, so really, I'm a weed fighter. I've got to eliminate the weeds in order to, there to be grass. And so what you understand is that, that uh, grass thrives when the pH, that pH of the soil is balanced. Uh, weeds thrive when it's acidic. And so I liken that to the more me is in my life, the more acidic I become, the more Christ is in my life. So we apply lime to the ground, which is uh, a, a ground up rock. And I said, that's the Jesus that's in you. that brings you back up where grass can flourish and grow. You know, Grass needs a lot of help. It's going to grow. Weeds are con constantly competing with that. Some weeds, we can cut the bloom off and it'll die and won't come back. But some got to dig down deep. You know, I always say that uh, uh, like mowing the field is like repentance. But you got to get down deep into your heart and get the root system out or it's going to come right back again and choke out the grass. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful word picture. And, and I want you to just kind of go through the we, we talk about the, the real practical benefits of following Christ. I mean, we're, we're, putting, our, we're putting our life in his hands. I mean, if you're, if you're in China, uh, you're in uh, other oppressive governments, uh, to, to become a Christian really does threaten your life. Uh, how do you get that, that sense of, of uh, total commitment uh, and, the, and the benefits? How do you, how do you, you show somebody the benefits of, of accepting Christ when we're in a society that, uh, we, we don't really think we have any true need. I understand. <clears throat> I was 10 years into my marriage whenever I sat on a, on a street corner uh, trying to figure out how I was going to survive marriage. And, you know, uh, I was a pastor, and my wife was not happy. I was not happy. And God took me on a journey at that point in my life to try to teach me how to allow him to empower me to do what I could not do. You know, there's a lot of folks out there that can, can identify with, there's no greater hell to live in than the discord of marriage. I've now been, I'm now in my 50, 50 year of my marriage and uh, it's not, I'm, I'm trapped in it, but it's where I want to be, it's where I'm living. And how I got from that sitting on the street corner in total despair as a young pastor, 
to where I am today is because I learned to really walk in the power of God. He brought life into me where there was death. And I learned to be able to be allow him to speak through me rather than me do my reflex reactions mm-hmm. and defenses and all those kind of things. And uh, so walking with him gave me uh, a power that I didn't know, even though I've been a Christian for you know, 15, 20 years at that time. I'd already graduated seminary, but I did not really know uh, his voice. And I didn't really know how to let him do something through me. And uh, I wasn't really, I thought that I was a dedicated Christian, but my life was, was running by, by my own power and strength. You know, I was trying to impress God with how good I could be and, and how dedicated I could be. And really, I was failing miserably in it. And so he, he, brought, he brought life to me in this. And so Jesus said, I've come to give you life, but you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up my will for your life and follow. Follow means you, you get your eyes on, on the one in the lead and you don't, you don't lose sight of that. You let him model how you live. You don't take your cues from the world. It, that's 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 an excellent point. I have one one little criticism, Ed, of, of of the book is the cover of it is this beautiful path going out into the horizon, and it kind of reminds me of a, a really nice devotional book that somebody would sit down and feel good about the the rest of the day. But this book is a challenge on every page. I think you got a, two or three sermons in each chapter here. This is a challenge all the way through. I mean, well, it's a hard hitting book, but at the same time, it, it's it's life. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I have preached through the book uh, almost every, uh, well, every chapter is a sermon or, mm-hmm. you know, or, or a combination of sermons. But, uh, you know, uh, it hits it hits hard because I hopefully have, have stayed with the truth of Jesus. Truth mm-hmm. is confronting because it confronts us with who we are and it also confronts us with who we can be if we're willing to yield ourselves to him as our Lord. And, you know, we, we very flippantly easily say, I believe in Jesus. He's the Lord of my life. Well, Lord, what does that mean? You know, come on. How does he maneuver your life? How do you, how, in what way are you yielded to him in that, set, in that sense? When I was writing this book, I, uh, I spent, uh, I guess, three or four years writing it. Because mm-hmm. when I write it, I say, oh my, what? People will throw the book against the wall. They'll 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 quit listening to me. And I had to try to lay a foundation and then get into the message because at the end of the day, what I'm saying is, if you've not made adequate preparation, you, you and you think you have, isn't that the most sad thing in the yeah. world? You think you're a Christian when you're not. You think you're the part of the people of God and you're not. You know, Jesus confronted people. All I say to folks is, you know, don't get upset with me. Pick up your Bible, read the Gospels, and listen to Jesus as he confronted, confronted people continuously about, you only offer me your lips. You don't offer me your heart. Yeah. You offer me a, relig- a religion and a ritual, but you don't give me your life. And wow, I was, you know, I mean, all I could do is say, man, all I can do is repeat what you're saying. Yeah. You know, and that's what I'm trying to do. And that's, that's the truth we find in the Gospels. And, I, you know, it doesn't, I, I was going to say it doesn't take away from the message, but your word pictures in there uh, really attract people deeper into the book because they're going to find out more about what you're doing out in the fields and what you're doing with Sadie. And so it does draw you into the book, but very well written. But I, I want to f- kind of flip over here a little bit because you're also a, a Vietnam veteran. Thank you for your service. We appreciate your, your dedication there. But uh, you've got a heart for uh, Christian veterans that are still dealing, even now, from Vietnam back in the 60s and 70s, still dealing with PTSD. You've been a counselor for years, and you've kind of specialized also in, in dealing with, with people who have PTSD. Yes, sir. Uh, I spent three years in the juvenile court uh, working with kids, troubled kids, many of them abused, many of them sexually abused, physically abused, and the, the dysfunction of family. Uh, I spent three years in a home for juvenile delinquents who also troubled kids. And my wife and I, we've, we've had several sets of foster children. So in that experience, I've, you know, pe- uh, the uh, post-traumatic stress thing is not only a, a, a thing that happens to warriors, but it's things that, pe- that people deal with every day in life. Any traumatic event can be that kind of thing that, that triggers these memories that you get trapped in and you can't get beyond. 
So I, I, I've dealt with veterans. I've dealt with a lot of uh, young girls who have been uh, sexually, physically abused and, and boys as well. So, yeah. How do you, uh, when somebody's dealing with PTSD, depending on how, how they deal with it, but it's the middle of the night, it's three o'clock in the morning and they wake up and they're right back there on the battlefield. They're right back in the midst of it. They're seeing the carnage. Uh, what, what's your advice to them? All right. Uh, I'm trying to just figure out, as we say in the country, it's hard to put five quarts in a gallon jar. Mm -hmm. You know, to talk about this subject, I need a little bit, a lot more room. <laughs> yeah. But, but it, it, it anyway, uh, here's what I'd say. The mind is like a uh, picture album. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, I have, I have an album of my wedding photos. I have an album of the kids growing up. I have an album. Of, and so when my mind picks up a picture, I tell folks, you need, you need to not, uh, uh, especially when, they, when the, the, the mind is picking up some of those photos out of those bad experiences, mm -hmm. I'd say every photo that your mind picks up is a window through which the devil can take you down into that which is not productive, that which is harmful. You got to recognize that. And I, I talk to people that have been, uh, say, have been raped or, or, or abused sexually or physically. I say, you know, this album you have, make sure you put labels underneath them, like a soldier. War is humanity at its worst. War is failure. But you're called upon in duty to go and respond to do what you are asked to do. Now, you've got to be able to understand quickly. My mind has opened this picture album. I got to close it as quickly as possible. I've got to not go relive that. I need to look at that picture and the label under it is war is humanity at its worst. War is failure. War is, is heinous. Close the book. The longer you open it, it's just like temptation to sin. The longer I look at a pretty lady, the, fur the further I'm going to go deep down in it. It's a window through which when I see something and recognize the beauty of it, then the devil, it's a window through which he can take me down to thinking about, oh, and what she'd look like this and what, you know, and we just keep going on down. you got to understand that the mind opens these photos. And you've got to say, okay, you know, like a, you know, a girl that's been abused, it say the label is I was a victim. I couldn't do anything about it. What was done to me was wrong. What was done to me was, was the act of the devil and, and through someone. And, you see, and so see the picture, look at the label, close the book. The longer you hold on to that picture, the deeper you're going to go down. You know, uh, there, there. One of the great stories I have to share with, with soldiers is uh, uh, that I believe the Apostle Paul suffered from post-traumatic stress. Yeah. 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 Think of it this way. There was, a, there was a war that was called. Judaism decided to launch war against Christianity. Okay, what do you do in war? You take people captive. You kill people. You know, you and Paul, and he... he, he volunteered for service to that war, taking authority from Jerusalem. He went to Damascus and he was going there to persecute, to arrest, to imprison. Now, I, I know that Paul suffered from this because all throughout his writings, these photos jump up at him. Mm -hmm. You know, in the book of Acts, when Luke is writing the story uh, of, of the early church, he wasn't there when it happened, but he said when he's talking about Stephen being stoned, and boy, that's a, can you imagine taking rocks? hitting the guy until they knock him down and he did till they beat life out of him. And they said, and he just very casually, Luke says, and they laid the, their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And how did he know that? Because he traveled on missionary journey with Paul and Paul remembered those stories and he would tell them again because they, they, they could haunt him and he had to be able to deal with it. When he was arrested for being in the temple in Acts 22, he himself in his defense said, I was there when Stephen was stoned, and I was approving. So he was remembering that. When he wrote to the church at Galatia, he said, uh, uh, I, you know, I was known as the one who persecuted the church, who's now preaching the gospel of the church. And then uh, uh, when he wrote Timoth to Timothy at the end of his ministry, one of the late, later books that he wrote, he said, I formerly blasphemed, I formerly persecuted, and insulted you. So he still was remembering those things. But what he said to Timothy, but I received mercy and grace. 
and God helps me cover those things over and go. And, and I say to people, Paul didn't live in the past. He could live in the past of all of that. But he lived in the grace and mercy of God that allows him to live in the present. And Paul, where he invested himself once in a war, and people were persecuted, people were killed, families were disrupted, all that uh, evil stuff. He now was saying he invested his life in what would, would uh, 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 be a solution to war. And that is, as, as Isaiah said, they'll not hurt nor destroy in all my uh, holy mountain, for the knowledge of God will cover the land, uh, uh, cover as the seas cover the land. Now, what Paul did, he didn't live in the past. The devil would like for you to live in the past. Jesus always points us to the future. He didn't hold our sins against us. He didn't hold, he, we're not identified by all that past. And so he was. He, his life now was invested in something positive as a solution to the very thing that tormented him, where he was once a part of it, as he did uh, with Stephen. So that's why I like to take folks. I'll be back with more of my interview in just a moment. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Lacey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Lacey. We're joined again by pastor and author Ed Malone, and Ed enjoys putting spiritual principles into simple concepts that we can all relate to. Do you think the church has a, has a, a place in, in ministry to, to people with PTSD? Uh, I, I, you hear, see a lot of addiction uh, classes, you see a lot of uh, uh, married, uh, you know, uh, mixed marriage classes and, and uh, single mother classes, things like that. Do you think that, that the church really has a place in uh, uh, helping people that have PTSD where they need somebody that, that has experienced themselves and, and knows what they're dealing with? How, how can the church help? Okay. Uh, I, God has brought a new, uh, a new um, a man into my life. He 20 years special forces. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's a professional soldier, been through just horrendous things. And, uh, and as I talk with him, he said, don't give people 12 steps, give them Jesus. Uh -huh. so, and here's, here's the point that, that, that he tries to make with, the, with it. It is uh, that, that famous thing that Paul said, we, we take our thoughts captive to obey Christ, meaning 
our thoughts are the are the places where, I, as I said earlier, that the, the devil can take us down into negativity, can take us down into depression, can take us down into uh, all reliving all of that. Don't relive it. You know, it's like I, I you know, okay, it's like. Well, I'm I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me <laughs> slow down. Okay, no. uh, now, now taking your thoughts captive is a spiritual discipline. It is is being able to say there's something comes in my head and, and and by the power of God I deal with it, not with the power of tricks, techniques, step two, step four, step five, yeah. those kind of things. You know, I need to do step five right now. You know, what I need is. If I live in the presence of God, I live in peace. One of the ways you know that you, you're getting into the presence of God is peace. A peace that surpasses understanding. A joy the world knows not. Even when Paul and Silas were beaten for casting the demon out of the slave girl, they were in, 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 in stocks and bonds in the cell at the midnight hour singing the praises of God. Where does that come from? Okay, they were, they were mistreated and and, and harshly treated, and yet they're singing the praises of God because their joy, their peace was from inside out. It's not what's on the outside that was generating peace for them, but what was on the inside that was being expressed. So whenever the, the mind, you know, can, you know, I wish I could blank out some of my files, you know, but you can't blank them out. But I, I, I learned how to, you know, I have things in my life, like all of us do, that I hate to remember where I did something I shouldn't have done. I, I do things that I've regretted, you know, like Paul talks about in Romans 7. But I, I learned to not live there and not be identified with that. I look at that thought. I take it captive. I, what, what, I, what I like to tell people is this. Look at yourself and think of yourself as God does. You know, and, and, and let his presence just overwhelm you, and you'll find peace in the midst of what you, you if you if you stay far enough back in the past you're going to live in all that pain again and relive it over and over again and uh and it, it will prevent you from being able to live in the present do you think there's uh to, to grab hold of christ in those situations and not go through some 12-step program you think there's a place for the church to i mean the church should be teaching that for these people yes Absolutely. The church needs to, to be able to teach people uh, what it means, uh, like I said, okay, here, let me give you an example, okay. If, if well, like when I was a kid at home, when we are having a guest over, you know, you know, it, what, I don't put my feet on the table, you know, I don't wear my cap to the, to, the, to the table, you know, I'm at my best position at the table, I don't, you know, lay down on my food, also. <laughs> Yeah. You've got important guests in the house. It should be supposed to change the behavior. You get the best dishes out, all that sort of thing. Well, here's the point I try to make it is Jesus has come to live in us. In, he said, I'll come and make my home in you. I'm not just going to visit. I'm going to live with you. With him inside of me, then it should be transforming everything I do and every, how I live. I shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, so if I, if the church teaches people how to be aware that Jesus is inside of you like a special guest in your house and he go he walk around in every room in your house is you start changing everything that you do and everything that you are and then that his presence in you as you know if if he's in living in my house and I start to fuss with my wife and I look over at him and what's he going to do he's going to be sad and he's going to be standing there saying here I am to help you and you won't let me you know, grieving the spirit, quenching the spirit, that kind of concept, you know, and, and you know, you, you know, and you would say, and, and my mom would look at me and say, well, you act that way with Jesus in the house. Come on. You know, well, we, we don't really believe Jesus lives inside of us. We don't, we don't really live in that dimension where, you know, Paul said uh, in, in Colossians, whatever you do, whatever you say, do it in the character of Jesus. Whatever you do, whatever you say, do it as serving him. So if I'm saying something to my wife, it should be something I can say to Jesus. And you say, oh, man, wait <laughs> yeah. a minute. Uh, we got okay now. Now, I, I don't mind being uh, believing in God, but, you know, this is going a little too far. Well, it's not going too far. You know, it's the way to find life. I can, I can tell you, I can shout it from the rooftop. I know what it is in the pain of marriage. You know, I know how it 
Look what that is. But I know what to live in, how it is to live in the peace of Mary because I allow Jesus to. And there are times in my life whenever my wife says something stress related, you know, that she just says something because she's tired and wore out. And I want to take it personally. You know, uh, uh, I, I start responding and I stop and say, well, wait a minute. Could we st- uh, could put a pause button here? I got to go outside. Get my get my mind right where I'm with God, you know, making sure that His presence is penetrating me, and I come back in and then we talk, you know. But living this, the, living what we uh, say we believe, and that is Jesus is inside of me, you know, He's making His home in me, and He is uh, available to me to talk through me and to affect my life. You know, when I'm in the presence of God, like Paul and Silas, you can beat me and throw me in prison. And I'm still going to sing the praise of God. When I'm in the presence of God, you can spit in my face, but make sure I am before you spit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I am a combat veteran. You know, don't be spitting in my face unless you know that I'm standing in the presence of God. But, uh, yeah, but anyhow, if you're really truly in the presence of God, what did Jesus do? You know, when they, they spit in his face, they pulled out his beard, they smacked him, you know, and he did not respond. I want to be able to be able to do that. And I want to do that not in my power, but because he is in me and doing it through me. And so that transforms everything. So we, we're not teaching people how to fight spiritual battles, you know, in the mind. We're not teaching people how to really live empowered by Christ being in us. Uh, and, and we, you know, it's a neat little story. You know, we, we think of Jesus as a shepherd carrying a sheep around in his arm. Well, the shepherd carries a staff. And you go in the wrong direction, he's going to whoop you across the nose. Not because he's mean, but because he wants to keep you from dying. Yeah. And that's the whole point we just wrestle with. We, we, you know, that, that old lie that the devil gave Eve in the garden, God's trying to keep something good from you. Yeah. And so, but I, I, my fences on my farm are to keep the cows from eating the, the winter supply of hay. You know, fences are uh, the laws which give me life. They are not the laws that are arbitrarily chosen just so God can prove that he's the boss. Those fences, when I believe that they're there for my good, transform my life totally. So what I'm saying to you is this, you know, in the pro, uh, to, uh, we were really on the, the uh, uh, traumatic stress thing. But the thing is, only if you have that power of God in you, feeling his presence, only if you're yielding to him and saying, as Paul said, as he told Timothy, forgetting about the past, I press on to that which is new. You know, he, he said, I could live in the past of my, how I was stupid and wrong, listening to my leadership and getting into this war that I shouldn't have gotten into. OK, but he said, forgetting that I, I, I walk in the grace of God that allows me to do something positive instead of living in the past. Wow. Well, Ed, thank you for inviting us into your house today. We just really appreciate it. The book, again, is uh, Three Simple Words, Come Follow Me, and if I'm ever in Tennessee, I'm coming to your church. Oh, thank you. If you, <laughs> if you come to Tennessee, you can, you can spend the night on the farm, and, and if you're not a vegetarian, we, we, we've got fresh meat, okay? <laughs> it's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. So we'd appreciate your financial support. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining us.